The outcome yesterday is not a surprise, not to those of us who have been studying this. The chairman now is Dr. Is, uh, Dr. Dahi Kalik, former ambassador, as you know, in London for five years. He had made two forecasts, one that there would be a referendum, as far as goes, three years, and secondly, that if held, it would be lost. In the book that uh, Tom has referred to, um, we identify the cause of that, uh, putting it very simply and as uh, uncontroversially as is possible, uh, as English nationalism. Uh, it has, of course, crystallized uh, around the question of uh, immigration. So <clears throat> I think that uh, we now are going to live with the consequences of that for quite a considerable time. So the effects uh, we projected very recently were on, on the markets, on sterling currency, and on the Prime Minister Cameron himself. Uh, we know what has happened in the uh, past few hours, both in relation to the markets and sterling. And of course, Mr. Cameron announced his uh, retirement or resignation as Prime Minister at 8.15 this morning. We know as well the timetable for what lies ahead. We know that uh, under the timetable that Prime Minister Cameron has himself laid down, his successor will be elected within the next three months. Personally, I would think it'll be much quicker than that. And personally, I think the candidate for the new office is, uh, is quite clear. Once the bell is sounded by the, the, the timetable is started by the new Prime Minister, we know that the, we have two years inside which to complete the negotiations. Uh, we know as well, of course, that that period of time can be if, uh, extended if there is unanimous agreement amongst all of the parties, that would be to say all 28, um, currently 28 member states. We know the process uh, of the negotiations are governed by two articles of the treaties, Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union, and Article 218 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Article 50 is the one that uh, sets down the timetable. But it also has a very important element within it that's important to remember, that it says that the negotiations are conducted by the departing state with the European Council. So the European Council, as we know, is composed of prime ministers, essentially, and one or two presidents. But it's very much, therefore, located at the core of the European Union in the European Council. Uh, the European Council will, have, will nominate a negotiator to conduct this business on, on its own behalf. There's not yet known who that is or should be, uh, but I said over a month ago that in all probability it's going to be uh, President Donald Tusk, President of the Council. Uh, who, of course, appeared earlier on this morning, making the first, giving the first reaction of the institutions to the outcome of the referendum. Probably <coughs> assisted by uh, President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker on behalf of the Commission. Under the article, we know that there are two items on the agenda for the negotiations to be completed within the two years. Arrangements on the one hand for withdrawal and the determination of the future relationship <coughs> of the United Kingdom uh, with the European Union. Neither of them are going to be easily disposed of, and in fact the disentanglement of the United Kingdom from the European Union is something that fills us all, I think, with the greatest apprehension uh, and, and fear. It is so complicated that I don't even really know how it's going to be accomplished. I did voice the opinion uh, a month ago that it would not be done inside of two years. As for the new relationship, well, um, you can think of that yourself in terms of how practical it is. We know as a consequence of Article 50 that um, the United Kingdom will be isolated in these negotiations. It now negotiates in the sense that it negotiates only on its own behalf. The other 27 <coughs> member states constituting the European Council will negotiate uh, as a unit. And in fact, this new process will begin as early as next Monday. There will be a meeting on the margin of the European Council meeting. The 27 uh, member states will meet under the presidency of uh, Donald Tusk to begin to work on their negotiating mandate and also the uh, procedures that they're going to 
adopt. As I said over a month ago, legally the United Kingdom will remain, of course, a member of the uh, European Union until such time as the new treaty is given effect, because that's almost certainly what it's going to be. Uh, but politically, everything has changed, of course, and uh, from next Monday on, there'll be a rather cold breeze blowing around the chair occupied by the Prime Minister of Britain. To all intents and purposes, uh, I speak as a former politician, he's now in a completely different uh, relationship than he had even 24 years ago, 24 hours ago. The concern, I think, that <coughs> we uh, in the Institute and here in Dublin, our concern has got to be with the political and economic effects of the withdrawal of the United Kingdom. What we have used as an expression in a press release we've issued uh, earlier today on behalf of the board is that it will be an asymmetric shock. That's an expression borrowed, as some of you, a lot of you, I hope, will recall, from earlier debates we had on uh, membership of uh, economic and monetary union. The question of asymmetric shocks of various components of the, of the union was something that occupied us here at great length. Some have said the uh, question of an asymmetric shock, of uh, economic and, and, and political, is perhaps using terminology that's not too easily understood or is a bit archaic. So we've also implied as a synonym uh, disproportionate effect, which I think uh, expresses it very clearly. I think Ireland has got to get this point over very, very clearly and very simply with the other 26 member states with whom we will be negotiating. And I think it sets a negotiating framework for Ireland. It's not that you're looking for a special or singular deal with the United Kingdom. It is to say that within the context of an overall deal being done with the United Kingdom, that the, the, the existence of a disproportionate impact on this country is something that has got to be recognized and accepted by the other 26, and that uh, as a consequence, they're going to, well, not give a special treatment, but certainly give a sympathetic treatment. I think as a consequence, uh, we really have four interlocutors upon whom we must concentrate. Since Gareth Fitzgerald was foreign minister back in 73, we have always positioned Germany and France at the core of our negotiating strategy. Uh, therefore, that uh, should remain to be the case, and I think that um, <clears throat> it means that Chancellor Merkel and President Hollande, for such time as both of them maintain themselves in office, uh, will be the two key uh, people with whom the Taoiseach will be liaising. At the same time, uh, the, the other two are the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, whom I mentioned earlier, and of course the President of the Commission, Juncker. Those four people <coughs> really are at the core, to, core of our negotiation strategy. Um, we know that there will be no special deal for Ireland, as I mentioned, in the sense of uh, bilateral, but it's got to be part of an overall uh, deal. Now, that's going to be a tricky diplomatic challenge, but I have absolutely every confidence in the DFA and the Department of Taoiseach to pull that off. In these negotiations, I think we um, will be wanting to put the point uh, clearly before our other our colleagues and friends, the other member states, uh, of the impact on Northern Ireland. It's obvious that um, there's going, now, obviously there's going to be a, a referendum in Scotland. We're looking at uh, the possible withdrawal of Scotland from the United Kingdom. What <clears throat> we always anticipated here, as long as over 20 years ago, is that this is going to have significant political and psychological knock-on effects in Northern Ireland. It goes to the very heart and very core <coughs> of the self-consciousness of the unionist population. The very foundations upon which their membership of the United Kingdom uh, rests is going to be pulled from under them. There isn't any doubt uh, as a consequence that we're, we are going to have here in the Republic a set of problems uh, that nobody else is going to confront. People of my age, who, are, who would uh, even privately admit to it, uh, will recall what the situation was like uh, in the late 1960s, beginning in 1968 with the civil rights marches and uh, August of 1969 with the outbreak of violence uh, first in Derry, 
uh, and then in Belfast. And of course, the terrifying consequences uh, are to the 70s and, so, and into the 80s. We don't want to see that reoccur. And therefore, we need the sympathetic understanding of our colleagues in the other member states to ensure that it doesn't happen. We're going to deal with the um, border consequences, as uh, the chairman has said, uh, to Blair Horn, who's a, an expert in this area. Clearly, the disproportionate effects on our economy, especially on trade, uh, that will be handled by John McGrain, Director General of the, of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. And the effect on the EU as a whole, uh, the introduction of a new dynamic into the EU, which is inevitable now, will be handled by Pat Cox. Uh, and, of course, the economic consequences as a whole will be handled by uh, Don O'Brien. My concluding remarks are <coughs> purely personal uh, and along the following lines. That really, I think, it's, uh, I think it will be unhelpful to talk of doomsday scenarios for the European Union. It came into being before the United Kingdom membership. They refused to join in the creation of the coal and steel community. They refused to join in the creation of the European Economic Community, and then set up a rival organization to uh, try to undo it. And having failed, they uh, applied for membership uh, not once, not twice, but across but three times. And now they're parting. I think there are one or two agenda items that we've got to look at very carefully and accepting life as it is now. We should look at the economic opportunities that arise from the departure of a major economy, such as the relocation of various uh, functions, but not just manufacturing, but also head office functions, and of course, um, major uh, sectors of the economy, such as the financial services sector, and the fact that foreign direct investment will now be re-diverted away from the United Kingdom, and some, but hopefully, will come in here. And within the EU, I think we've got to look at the consequences and that we, because of the special relationship we have with the United Kingdom, that we could play a very positive role, that of being the informed insider, uh, offering wise advice. I know that that has already happened. We need a clear-headed <coughs> assessment of Irish interests. And uh, from our experience here, that has been very expertly and exhaustively done by the Department of the Taoiseach. Uh, I think that um, the, 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 the game that they uh, have currently have got put together uh, identifies a series of risks that exceed, well exceed 100 and practically come up to 200. And in each case, there is a game plan for dealing with them over quite a period of time ahead. But what it does suggest is that the Institute should continue with its work in this area. So we will produce a report now uh, to coincide with the appearance of a new British Prime Minister, that is to say sometime in October. And we will then hold a major conference on that report and we will continue our, our, uh, our, our work, obviously, over the next two to three years. So there, I think, is an overview of what it is we see this morning. Uh, it's a position that none of us would have wanted to be in, but well, we are here, so we have to deal with it. And I thank you for coming.